Good morning and welcome to this short act of worship. Today is the last Sunday after Trinity. We begin with the collect, the special prayer for today. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from the prophecy of Jeremiah, chapter 14, verses 7 to 10 and 19 to the end. Jeremiah 14, verses 7 to 10 and 19 to the end. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our, apost our apostasies indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its saviour in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveller turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot give help? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning this people, Truly they have loved to wander, they have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but find no good. For a time of healing, but there is terror instead. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonour your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Lord our God? We set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 84 verses 1 to 7. The response to the psalm. Happy are those who dwell in your house. Happy are those who dwell in your house. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing to enter the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who dwell in your house. Blessed are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion who going through the barren valley find there a spring, 
and the early rains will clothe it with blessing. Happy are those who dwell in your house. They will go from strength to strength and appear before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. Happy are those who dwell in your house. The New Testament reading is taken from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 to 8 and 16 to 18. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8 and 16 to 18. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defence, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his, his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. It's Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who, who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.
there are a whole host of different forms of sin which are prevalent in our society today. But there's one particular type of sin which is often overlooked and which, if we're really honest, is one which we're all prone to committing from time to time. And that's the sin of self-righteousness. The way in which we can all too easily think of ourselves as being somehow morally superior to others. It's an attitude which gives rise, for instance, to, to the belief that there's always someone out there who's more sinful, more evil than we are. And so we take comfort in thinking, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. Or even, God, I thank you that I'm not like them. And it's this all too prevalent attitude which the Lord deals with in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Now, as one of the prominent groups of religious leaders in Israel at the time, the Pharisees tended to see themselves as being morally superior to others. These were the guys you'd most expect to see in the temple, praying on a very frequent basis. So in this parable, when the Pharisee goes along to the temple to pray, his superior attitude entirely influences the way in which he prays. He begins by thanking God that he's not like other sinful people. As far as he's concerned, he's perfectly righteous. He has fully convinced himself that he's not a sinful person and therefore he has no need to ask God for forgiveness. He even stands by himself well away from the tax collector so that he doesn't get contaminated by their impurity. And then he goes on to tell God about all the wonderful things that he does. His practice of fasting twice a week and his practice of giving away a tenth of all of his income. As if God needs to be reminded about these things. Now this might at first all seem fine. Here's a guy who's faithfully carrying out good works. So what's the problem? Well, the problem lies in his actual reason for doing good works. He sincerely believes that by doing all these good works, he could earn acceptance with God. But unfortunately for him, nothing could be further from the truth. He's so caught up in his own self-righteous thinking that he fails to go home justified before God. He fails to be restored to a right relationship with God. One could say that the Pharisee's problem was not that he was not far enough along the road, but that he was on the wrong road altogether. And notice that Jesus doesn't say that the Pharisee in this story is actually righteous, but that the Pharisee thought himself to be righteous. Luke carefully notes that this parable was aimed at those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, not that God regarded them to be so. Now, by contrast, we have the character of the tax collector. And the first thing to say about him is simply that you probably couldn't find a more different person from the Pharisee in first century Jewish society. Tax collectors collected taxes and customs on behalf of the Romans who occupied the land. And they were generally despised within Jewish society because of their extortionate practices. They were pretty shady characters, trying to make a quick buck 
often by dishonest means. And to top it all, for strict Jews like the Pharisees, tax collectors were seen as ceremonially unclean on account of their regular contact with Gentiles, non-Jews. So the tax collector in the parable clearly knows his place in society. In fact, he stands at a distance because he would have known that the Pharisee would not want him to go anywhere near him. His deep sense of guilt on account of his sin and the profound sense of unworthiness he felt meant that he could not even lift up his eyes toward heaven. And his prayer is simple. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Unlike the Pharisee, he has no list of good works which he can parade before God in order to show what a wonderful person he is. All he can do is simply acknowledge that he is a sinner and throw himself on the mercy of God. What's more, whereas the prayer of the Pharisee was very much self-centred, the tax collector's prayer is wholly focused on God. And so it's the tax collector who humbles himself before God, who goes home justified. He goes home put right with God and not the proud Pharisee. We find a similar approach to prayer in our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah. There the people of Judah are facing disaster as a punishment from God for their lack of faithfulness to him. So the prophet pleads with God on behalf of his people. They have nothing good to show for themselves, no list of virtuous deeds which they can parade before the Lord. All they can do is confess their sin. Our iniquities testify against us. Our apostasies indeed are many. As well as to acknowledge that their total dependence is upon the mercy of God, the hope of Israel. So what then does all this say to us about our own personal walk with the Lord? Well, first of all, what this parable teaches us very clearly is that when it comes to sin, we're all in the same boat. None of us can condemn others for their sinfulness when we ourselves are sinful and in constant need of God's mercy. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 The problem with the Pharisee was that he was so bothered about condemning others for their sinfulness that he failed to look into his own heart and recognise his own sinfulness and his own need for forgiveness. In fact, condemnation of other people is really our way of avoiding facing up to our own wickedness. There's a regular feature on the website of the Worthing Herald entitled, Here are some of the criminals jailed in Sussex in whatever month. Now, rather than simply offering a list of outcomes of court cases, it often takes the trouble to actually provide us with mugshots of all those individuals sent down for misdemeanors of various kinds. And so it's so tempting to look upon these folk with a sense of disdain and moral superiority, thankful perhaps that we're not like them. Whenever we, fail, whenever we feel tempted to think of ourselves as being more righteous 
than others though let's not forget that we're all sinners you me the tax collector the pharisee the jailed criminal we're all equally in need of the redemption which christ offers through his death on the cross then secondly the parable reminds us of one of the most central truths of the Christian faith. The fact that we are justified by God, we are put right with him on the basis of faith in Christ and his saving death, and not on account of our good works. Our good works, however plentiful they may be, do not in themselves put us right before God. What the Lord really wants is for us to follow the example of the tax collector in this parable who fully acknowledges his sinfulness and throws himself completely on the mercy of God. He is truly saved by God's grace through faith. It's rather as a consequence of experiencing the love of God made known through Jesus Christ in our lives that we are then compelled to show God's love to others. Our, goods, our good works should be a fitting response to God's love for us, not a means of trying to earn God's favour. Good works are not a substitute for faith, but rather the outcome of faith. All other religions in their various ways are based on the idea that we need to do good works in order to get right with God or some divine being. And so many people are misled into assuming that Christianity teaches the same. Nothing can be further from the truth, though. Because the Christian gospel speaks of the fact that no amount of good works can put us right with the living God. We need a saviour. It's only through the cross of Jesus Christ that we can stand forgiven before our creator. The Apostle Paul was one guy who certainly knew God's transforming mercy and grace in his life, transformed from being a persecutor of believers to one called by the Lord to lead the way in bringing the good news to the Gentiles. He was truly saved by God's grace alone through faith in Christ alone. And so in our epistle reading, as his earthly life was drawing to an end, Paul was able to look forward with confidence to Christ's return in glory when he would receive the crown of righteousness. And then thirdly, I believe this parable is reminding us that we need to get real before Almighty God. The Pharisees tried to tell God, the Pharisee tried to tell God what he's like, as if God doesn't already know. He forgets that God knows the real state of his heart, his real need for forgiveness. But instead, the Pharisee chooses to hide behind a facade. Perhaps we too need to get real before the Lord. We need to openly and honestly acknowledge our sinfulness before him and to humbly and sincerely seek his forgiveness. God knows our inner selves better than we do ourselves. So let's not hide behind a facade. The familiar words of the prayer of humble access in the communion service, I think, illustrates something of the attitude we should have when we come before God. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. 
we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. So to sum up, firstly, when it comes to sin, we're all in the same boat. We're all equally in need of Christ's forgiveness. Secondly, we are made right before God by faith in Christ alone and not through any good works of our own. And thirdly, let's get real before God. God knows each and every one of us through and through. We can't hide anything from him. He wants us simply to come before him with humility and in an attitude of penitence and faith. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that through the sacrificial death of your Son on the cross, we can know our sins forgiven and be restored to a right relationship with you. Whenever we feel tempted towards self-righteous attitudes, may we be reminded that it's through your mercy and grace alone that we are saved. In Jesus' name, Amen. And so now to a concluding prayer and then the blessing. Let us pray. God of all grace, your Son Jesus Christ fed the hungry with the bread of his life and the word of his kingdom. Renew your people with your heavenly grace and in all our weakness sustain us by your true and living bread who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.